Wisdom Literature. We're going to talk today about the life of Solomon, the third ruling king of Israel, and his, uh, his work, his wisdom, and then we're going to introduce wisdom literature by looking at his most popular book. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Proverbs. And maybe Song of Solomon, too. Yeah, it's probably, uh, the jury's probably out on which one is most popular. So, Elizabeth, if you could stand and read for us 1 Kings 2, 1 through 12. Everybody, why don't you go ahead and turn there? First Kings 2, 1 through 12. And what we're looking at here as an introduction to Solomon is the passing of the mantle of leadership from David to Solomon. Uh, let me get there as well. What was the reference again? 1 Kings 2, 1 through 12. And what you want to what you want to pay attention to is the some of the instructions that David gives to his son Solomon. And the kinds of themes that you hear. There will be some things that stand out to you. Pay close attention to that. Think about it. Maybe you'll have something to reflect on when Elizabeth is done reading that for us. So you go ahead. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and be, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, "Yeah, charged his son, Solomon, saying, I go the way of the earth. Be strong, therefore I prove myself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk his, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and commandments." and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you may also prosper in all that you do, in whatever you turn, wherever you turn. That the Lord may fulfill his word, which he has spoken concerning me, saying, If your sons take, take heed, to the way, walk before me in truth with all of the heart, their heart and with all of their soul. He said, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you know also that what Job, the son of... Just give it your best. Zerua. <laughs> yeah, Zeruiah. <laughs> That's did fine. to me, and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Ebner, the son of Nir, and Ashem, whatever, the son of Jareth, whom he killed, and he shed blood war of peace times, and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist on and on his sandals that were that were on his feet. Therefore, do according to your wisdom and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace, but show kindness to the son of Brazilia and Gilead. Gilead. And let them be among those who I fled and Absalom, your brothers. And see you have with you the son of Gear. Benjamin for Barham and who cursed me with malicious curses in the day when I met him. Yeah, there's a lot of them. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But he came down to meet him in Jordan, and I 
swore to him, the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with sword. Now therefore, do not behold him guiltless, for you are wise, you are a wise man, and know to bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. So David rested with his fathers and and was buried in the city of David. The period that David resigned over Israel was forty years, seven years. He rise in his herd or and and in Jerusalem he resigned thirty three years. Then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and kingdom was firmly established. Thank you. So when we introduce Solomon's life, we have the words from his father, the great king of Israel, David. What do you notice about the situation that Solomon was coming into? Anyone? What was your sense of the environment that Solomon had to sit on the throne? Was everything all straightened out for him? <laughs> no, why not? He tried putting a divorce in his kingdom. That also happened? Yep. There had been a, a very recent situation with, um, with uh, one of David's other sons coming on to the uh, being Adonijah, I believe, was put on by Joab and some others. So Joab was the great commander of the armies of David. And what does David have to say to Solomon about Joab here? Shut blood during peace time. Mm -hmm. All those things that Joab did, unlawful <coughs> assassinations, though they were enemies of David, uh, for the most part, the manner in which he went about their assassination was unlawful. And David rebuked Joab and was angry at him, but he didn't do anything about it at the time. And so Solomon inherits the situation with Joab and with Adonijah and with Shimei. You remember Shimei. Who remembers Shimei, what the situation was? Um, wasn't David fleeing from like Absalom? And then Shimei was like cursing him as mm -hmm. they walked along the road or something. Mm -hmm. and I can't remember what David said to him, but something something about him about not to kill him with his sword. Yeah. Yeah, part of that is David was keeping his promise to Shimei. Shimei saw David being humiliated. David was fleeing for his life with his company, his family, and all his officials and things. They're fleeing. And Shimei sees them begins to call down curses on David, taking advantage of his humiliation. And David looked at that as an opportunity to humble himself before God and receive that as a part of in as a part of what God was doing sovereignly in the situation, putting David out in a rejection of sorts for David's own sin as well. Because remember the promise or the prophet Nathan. In the prophetic word that there would be division and bloodshed even in his own house that the sword would not depart and so David's son was fulfilling that prophecy and David was on the run so Shimei curses him David looks as an opportunity to humble himself before God but then he says to his son Solomon you need to take care of that guy David made a commitment to him but then that commitment dies when David dies <laughs> And so we see here what is really a fitting end for the life of David, where his, uh, his reign as king and even his build-up to his reign was full of bloodshed and conflict, battles and treachery. And David's life ends with his giving instructions to his son Solomon to take care of all of these problem people, these messes that were left for Solomon. So you have to feel for Solomon here, the situation he has. Solomon was no, um, Solomon wasn't like a, you know, a mama's boy or something. At least we don't get anything like that from the text. But David did say to him, one of his first words here in his final instructions, 2 Kings 2, show yourself to be a man, which means you're going to have to step up to be the king. 
So there's something there that Solomon needed to be charged, and then certainly because of the kinds of things that David told him he needed to do. So for Solomon to become king, uh, he had to firmly establish his throne by removing or executing those who had conspired against David or had otherwise undermined his leadership. This included, we just talked about these, the execution of his half-brother Adonijah. And a situation happened after this that Adonijah put himself in the place of uh, being a traitor and brought it on himself. Joab, the commander of David's armies, you remember he ran to the altar and he said, kill me here. And so uh, Solomon's guard went in and killed him at the altar. We have Shimei, who had cursed David during his humiliation. And we also have the removal of Abiathar, the priest, who Solomon removes from leadership. And we find here fulfillment of the prophecy that the man of God had given a long time ago to Eli, because of Eli's failure to correct his sons, and his incorrect administration of the sacrifices, a man, what the scripture says in 1 Kings, or in 1 Samuel 2, 30-35, is that a man of God, he's not named, is meaning a prophet, an unnamed prophet, came in and said to Eli, gave him that prophecy, that his, uh, his descendants would be cut short. And so some of them were cut short in life and were killed, and we see here the continuing fulfillment of Abiathar, the priest who is a descendant of Eli, is removed from his leadership and replaced because of his, uh, because of his going against David and going with Joab. So we see here the continuing working of God through the circumstances, though some would have been unaware of that. Yes? But um, Solomon did not kill uh, his brother Adon Naya. He didn't he, kill him, right? His, a guard, yeah. Uh, he sent, um, let's see Benaniah. here. What's that? Benaniah. Yes. He, Benaniah. We yeah. have here 1 Kings 2, 13 through 25. Um, Benaiah. I'm just trying to find his name here in the passage. <laughs> Uh, if Adonijah does not pay with his life for this request. Yep, it's uh, verse 25, 225. King Solomon sent Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he struck down Adonijah and he died. Yep. Oh, no, that's okay. So it wasn't by the hand of Solomon. It was by the word. It was Solomon as king, but he gave the orders to his guard, Benaiah. Yep. Okay. We also find that Solomon was gifted with great wisdom. Gifted by God with great wisdom. His wisdom led to his writing of the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes <clears throat> and the Song of Solomon. He spoke, 1 Kings 4.32 tells us that Solomon, because of his gift of wisdom, he spoke... 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. Some of you that are psalmists and song writers, can you imagine writing 1,005 songs, unique songs? Do you think that would exhaust your creativity a little bit? <laughs> and he had a gift from God, a supernatural endowment of wisdom, and it just created this profuse amounts of inspired writing and songwriting. 1 Kings 4.32, it's an important note on wisdom on Solomon's wisdom because it is such a main theme of these passages and has given us a major section of our Bible. His works are included in what is traditionally known as wisdom literature or wisdom books in the Old Testament. So Solomon's very important in this manner. What he gave to us, what he wrote down, and what others brought in, uh, or what others later affirmed, his writings, both in wisdom and instruction, and also in uh, creative artistic literature. We have the Song of Solomon. And they uh, were affirmed as inspired by God and become so important to our faith. 
Solomon was gifted by God with great wisdom. His wisdom led to his writing of the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. We just said that one, didn't we? Yeah, so that sounds good. Uh, Solomon also penned the beautiful royal love story and song, the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, which expresses the love and passion of a young couple. Solomon and his bride-to-be. And it is viewed traditionally not only as a love story, but the passionate love of the bridegroom for his bride has, has been viewed for a very long time, even by Jews, first by Jews, as an allegory of God's love for his people, for Israel. And the church has continued that tradition and seen the inspiration of the Spirit on Song of Solomon and seeing it as an allegory of Christ's love for his bride, which is you and me, the church. And so we have both there. We have the gifts of Solomon, his giftedness, writing a beautiful royal love story. And then we have the inspiration of the Spirit behind that creative writing that brought out something so much bigger and such a great picture of God, who is the, the royal one, the royalty, and his love for his people, the way that he loves us. Solomon's great wisdom made him famous throughout the world. He was recognized as the wisest man on earth to be exceeded only by Jesus. And that's significant. 1 Kings 4, 29 through 34. He was recognized as the man with the greatest wisdom in all of the world. And the only person that exceeded that wisdom, at least in our understanding of Scripture and what we have, was Jesus himself. Wouldn't you say that's pretty significant, that kind of wisdom? And being the wisest man on earth in the people of Israel and as the king of Israel surely is reason for our forefathers to look at his writings and say, we see the mark of the Spirit there, when their king was looked at as the wisest man in the whole entire world. And there were a lot of wise people in the world then who were famous for that. Solomon's greatest contribution to the people of Israel was the great temple of the Lord, at least in their time. Uh, the temple of the Lord. Recorded in 1 Kings 5 and 6, chapters 5 and 6, as well as 2 Chronicles 2 and 7. And again, you will find in 2 Chronicles... In the book of Chronicles, you will find a lot of mirroring of what is in Kings with some more detail on some of the specifics of the temple and everything uh, in Chronicles. We'll be majoring on the account in Kings during our class time. <clears throat> we want to look at some of Solomon's wisdom, the great wisdom of Solomon on display. And I would like to have someone read for us 1 Kings 3. 16 through 28. Once you're there, okay. Hannah, as soon as you're there, go ahead and read that. 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28. Okay. Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, My lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She took him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, No, the living, <clears throat> the living one is my son. The dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. The king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead. While the other one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. The king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was filled with compassion for her son and said to the king, Please, my lord, give, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, Neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave this ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. 
When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe, because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Thank you. So we get some additional information to what it was like for Solomon. We had people coming to Solomon from outside of the people of Israel. We had two prostitutes who had a dispute uh, that would uh, not have been would not have been freely going about uh, their life as prostitutes as Israelites. And so we know that people, obviously, so we know that people are coming in from the outside because Solomon's wisdom was so great that he was being sought out by other peoples of other cultures and customs and faith. Yes? Do you think if actually left the situation, he would have had maybe five and a half for real? Or... I, you know, I thought about that, Melody, while I was reviewing this material yesterday and just thinking on it and just getting the sense of what was happening here. Um, I don't know. What we do know is that they thought he was going to, which tells us that the king's word was so authoritative. For we can tell the, re, the reaction, the emotional reaction tells us that they took that as being dead serious and literal. That he was, that he, as a king, he was, uh, he really didn't care about the situation. He wanted them out of the court. In, in his eyes, it was petty over some baby with two prostitutes from the outside of the people of Israel. Just get this out of my court. Just cut the kid and make these ladies shut up. In their minds, that's how he was giving up an order. And they took that as dead serious. So... Uh, but whether he would have done that or not, I don't know. I don't think so, because of where Solomon was at at this time, uh, walking after the Lord and walking in his wisdom. I don't think that he would have done that to a child. So that's just me, though. Yeah? This person he told to do that, because he, he didn't obviously do it himself, would have taken it as serious, and that's what all that mattered. Yeah. So that, yeah, he told somebody to do it, and the person oh, yeah. would have oh, yeah. it. He would have said, stop. <laughs> right, <laughs> sure. Would, that's right, Daniel. There, the guard would not have hesitated. No. No. He would have, all he would have needed was once he got his sword, he would have just waited for the, whatever the okay signal was, and he would have run that child right, would have <laughs> sliced that kid right in half. Yep. And so, but he didn't have to. So, Jacob. Couldn't anyone, like any parent, think that no one would want their child to die? I, I don't see it as exceptional for Solomon to think, oh, the woman that wants the kid to live is a real mother. Any parent, anyone would see that someone wants a child to live is a real mother. It's logical. It's not really a display of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's wise to think of that idea to yeah. figure out which one would say. To kill the kid? That's not really wise. No, he, uh, it's, it's what he did here. Um, he charged, by, uh, see, in what I was, when I thought this through, I'm thinking, what did Solomon do here? His order emotionally charged the atmosphere. He created an explosion of emotion all at once. People didn't think he was going to. He's the king and he's known for his wisdom. They thought he was going to do one of these moments, right? Hmm. And just start listening. So everybody's kind of getting in a mode to see. Let's see how he figures this out. And he says, cut the child in two. Shock. Total shock, everybody in the court. And there was a time to... You know, he's the king, and in their minds, once he said that, it was done. So they're thinking they're seeing a display of brutality in a king who's using his power to just get, you know, I have other things to do today. So he created a moment of shock, uh, and then he, but he drew deeply on the compassion of the real mother. So he, and he took a risk. He's taking a risk here. Yeah. He didn't know what was going to happen. But see, that's where he was compelled by the spirit and the wisdom he had put in him. I don't think that God prophetically spoke to him at that moment in the sense of saying, say this, like he was a prophet. But the gift of wisdom in his conscious, conscience spoke to his own mind and understanding. And there came a, there came a God-given shocking contest of the wills and the emotions of these two yeah, women. I, th I think yeah. the woman whose child it wasn't would have to be incredibly stupid to go apart from her ruse and say, yeah, kill my kid. Right. I mean, that... Yeah, and, and even more so, in the culture, men and women, uh, we think we didn't understand each other now. <laughs> you know, for Solomon to, draw, to connect deeply like that, 
Um, I shouldn't say that there that there was that we understand that men and women understand each other more now than they did then. That's not that's ignorant to say that. But uh, for for the king and his power and his uh, dealing with so many people to be so connected to that moment of what it is to be a woman and a mother, and just in an in pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought of it like. Uh, like what you were saying, they were expecting some like great thing of like wisdom on display, and like he kind of used like disguised wisdom. Like he said something that sounded like completely so dumb, but at mm -hmm. the same time he's being so wise, but just in disguise. Yeah. So we kind of think like, well, that wasn't a wise statement, but at the same same time he saw what was going to happen, so he was using wisdom in disguise, saying yeah. I'm going to act like I don't care about it. Yeah. Just cut it in half, like you were saying, but. Yeah, he's being really wise because he knows the outcome, even though that probably wasn't the most profound statement that he could say. Right. I mean, it was just brutal. Was, yeah. yeah. They were like, okay, okay, the wise king. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah, the wise king is now the wise and brutal king. Yes? I always wondered why the second prostitute was like, yeah, just cut him in half, because who would want to see a baby cut in half? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. She must have been in so much pain and mm -hmm. so cynical that, first of all, it led her to go, I'm just going to switch children because I can't handle this. And mm -hmm. then led her to say, you know what, I'm just done. I mm -hmm. can't do this. Yeah. And just reveal herself because she was in so much pain. It didn't take much for her bruise to be lifted. Right. The rivalry, they lived, they lived in a brothel. Yeah. They were prostitutes in a brothel. So they're already living a degraded and abused life in their society. And they're already down low on themselves and their sense of who they are, and that's just normal to them. They don't sit there and think therapeutic thoughts like that. They're just they're they're just miserable, desperate people. And so she just lost a child, empty, broken, grieving, angry, jealous, all of those things. And that's what seeing what Solomon's word did is he drew that out in an instant. Just it brought all of it screaming to the surface. And uh, it was, that's a, I want to say a beautiful moment, but <laughs> it freaked everybody out, I'd say. Someone else had their hand here. Yeah? It's not, but I was just going to say you could argue the fact that you kind of brought it up, the jealousy, like, well, if I can't have a baby, then I don't care if that's when it gets killed, because that means she won't have a baby now. And then, yeah. Right. Just her people. Yeah. Hateful sisters. They would be like hateful sisters because they both lived in the same brothel and... Uh, yeah, so this was like ultimate sibling rivalry over a dead child and, um, and a living child. So, yep, very uh, like jealousy to the extreme, Elijah. Yeah, hateful jealousy and a murderous, which revealed itself as a murderous jealousy, which is where jealousy and hate uh, go in their full end. So, yeah, anybody else thought I saw another hand? No? Okay, so the people were in awe of Solomon's wisdom, and his fame was spreading, and we see on display here this, uh, this mighty wisdom coming from God. Solomon's wisdom from God guided his life and work all the way, this is important here, all the way through the building of the temple of the Lord. We see his wisdom culminate in... The instructions and the leadership of building the temple of the Lord, which is recorded in 1 Kings 6, and his uh, manner in which he drew upon he, he drew upon his influence and his uh, power and his resources and wealth and brought things in from all over the world, the known world at the time. And he, uh, he built and filled the temple according to the commands of God and dedicated it all in front of the people in a grand celebration of consecration to God. In 1 Kings 8, 1 Kings 6 through 8, you see Solomon's dedication to the Lord. You see his surrender to God, his faithfulness to God, his faith in God, in worship of God. This is important because there's a turning point in Solomon's life around this time. The Lord blessed Solomon and gave him instructions and warnings during this time. God responded to Solomon's faithfulness and his consecration of the people and of the temple and of his own life and spoke to Solomon in a fresh way, uh, likely through 
the priests or a prophet revealed the word, brought the uh, revealed word of the Lord to Solomon, and God spoke words of blessings, and He cautioned or He warned Solomon, "You need to remain faithful to Me in My ways." And He warned him, and I'm paraphrasing: "If you don't, all that you have acquired, including what your what you and your people now have in this land." will be taken from you. And those words, uh, those words were heeded by Solomon at least at first. This is important to know about Solomon. Solomon grew to become the greatest king on earth in both wisdom and wealth. So he wasn't just the wisest person on earth. He was also the greatest king of his time in the known world. 1 Kings 10, 14 to 29 tells us this, that his wealth that he acquired, his riches, he amassed great wealth and riches and power, and he was the greatest man in the world. So the pri pri to say he was privileged is an understatement. To say he was blessed, in, in our understanding of blessed, is an understatement. He was put at the top of the world in his day. Truly, in every sense of the word, Solomon was there. Then we come to... The downfall of Solomon. Are you starting to tire of hearing of these outcomes of the kings of Israel or of the, of the uh, certain important ones in Scripture? Sometimes we get to these parts and we say, oh no, do we have to go through this again? And there's so much for us to learn when we think about their error and what happened and what set them up for these things to occur in their lives and we gained so much. Solomon's wealth and power made way for a life of ease and pleasure seeking. And that also is an extreme understatement of Solomon's situation. And Solomon writes openly, transparently about this in Ecclesiastes. He tells the story of what he did with his wealth and power and privilege. He got everything he wanted. We'll look at this uh, on Thursday. Whatever he wanted, whatever impulse he had, he could get it. The word buy wasn't even a consideration. The cost of something didn't matter to Solomon. Those things, did, the, 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 the idea of having to spend or having a cost for something that he wanted as a possession, that, that kind of way we deal with things on a regular basis, that wasn't a norm for him. Whatever he wanted, he got, and he got it all. He lands, houses, gardens, uh, properties, women, he got it all. Ease and pleasure seeking. Mm -hmm. Solomon became self-oriented and allowed a lack of integrity to slowly destroy him. 1 Kings 6.38 tells us that Solomon spent, here's our first sign that something is wrong here. He spent seven years building the temple of the Lord. That's a long time. And if you look at a scale of what the temple looked like and how big it was, in, uh, uh, I saw a picture of the <coughs> temple of the Lord next to some cars. And obviously that was a, it was a digital rendering. <laughs> Uh, they didn't have cars or photographs in those days. Uh, but you see how grand it was. If you put that in downtown Manhattan, it might not look like a big deal today, but in that day it was incredible. Huge and massive and gl glorious and glamorous. Spent seven years. But then the next verse tells us, 1 Kings 7 1, he spent 13 years building his own palace. Does it? Why? Does anybody see an issue here? Yep. Is anything standing out to anyone here? Do we have a problem? <laughs> He's taking advantage of his wealth, Elijah. That's right. He cares more about himself. He built the house of the Lord according to the instructions of the Lord with all its glory and all of its magnificence. And then he dealt almost doubled the amount of time for his own house. Glamorous palace. Uh, extremely massive palatial estate. Still the prosperity gospel back there. Oh yeah, hey, they, Aaron, that's a good point. It was uh, 
it was like the total excess part of the prosperity gospel when it's taken too far to have to do with lavish living and things like that. Spends one so, year Bible college and 13 million mansion. <laughs> So Solomon went, he, and this is our first sign here, uh-oh, something's not right. Like other powerful people and kings in his day, including his father David, <clears throat> Solomon fell into the trap of loving and marrying more than one woman. Not only did he marry more than one woman and uh, fall into that trap and that sin that God condoned, uh, in some ways, at least it seems in his silence during these times, he also married women from foreign countries outside, and this was what really started the engines of his race to, towards destruction. He married women from foreign countries in violation of Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. Gabriel, could you get that door there? Yeah. Just close that, thank you. Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. We're just jumping into the middle of these instructions. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and he must not acquire many wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Also, silver and gold. And here, just, uh, uh, you know, for good measure, it's in the same verse. And also, silver and gold he must not acquire in great, great quantity for himself. Uh-oh. Both of these here, we have a problem. 1 Kings 11.6 summarizes for us. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. Do you have any issues here, even with this statement that says in 11.6, Solomon fall, did not fall. Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. Was David perfect in his obedience? <laughs> David committed grievous sin against others and against God. He repented. He repented. That will never make light of David's sin never excused that kind of sin. He was not excused for his sin. He was forgiven and he walked in repentance. He suffered the consequences and there was terrible outcomes as a result of his sin. But he repented and he restored, walked in a restored relationship with God. He did not part from the worship of the Lord and his faith in the Lord, though he sinned, Solomon, in his sin, also turned away from the Lord and began to follow the detestable gods of the Canaanites. There's a big difference there. Melody. Do you think God did all that on purpose to test Solomon? To see if he would turn back and repent? Melody, that is such a great an analytical question of the situation because it brings up part of, part of the, the issues that we can get stuck on and say, wait a second. Didn't God reveal to Solomon in a dream? Because you have asked for wisdom earlier. Because, Solomon, you have asked for wisdom, and you did not ask for wealth and power and riches and all of those things, I will give you wisdom, and I will give you the wealth and the power that you didn't ask for. And so we find something here that makes us say, wait a minute. God blessed Solomon with all of this wealth and power. But it's what Solomon did with it. So what we do see, Melody, that God, um, God took the risk on Solomon. When, in your words, did he do it on purpose? He at least took, it, took the risk of lavishly blessing Solomon, giving him access to all that his... Uh, all, uh, that his his eyes and his hands wanted, Solomon took that too far and began to abandon the ways of the Lord with his freedom and his ease. So that's where we have the issue that God, God allowed that, and even you could say uh, made an opening for that to occur, and Solomon, of his own will and doing, I would say, went too far. Um, so, yeah, it's a great question. 
Well, you're, I can see you're thinking deeply here and connecting with the text. So you are. It's good. Yeah. Uh, good. So we say, wait a minute here. Uh, doesn't God have something to do in this situation? Where was God during all this? He was there. He was with. He was with Solomon. Uh, he was with Solomon when he was amassing all of his wealth and power. And it was a fulfillment of his promise to Solomon. And yet Solomon began to abandon the Lord. And so that speaks to us about the freedoms that we have and the risk that God will take on us when we are being blessed. So glad you brought that up. Yeah? Weren't there like things that Solomon had to uphold to keep his wisdom? Were there or did God give it to him? Just give it to him. I mean, I know he gave it to him, but were there things he had to like follow up or do in order to I don't know, keep that wisdom? I would say so, Elijah that he would have heard the reading of the law and uh, would have read that, uh, you know, would have been in the law. And he was walking, up until this time, he was walking, uh, as far as we know and all that we see, in the way that he consecrated the temple and himself and the people. He was walking in relationship with God. He was walking as a spiritual leader of the people, the king, and a spirit, one of the spiritual leaders. And um, so he was surrendered, he was committed to God. And I would say that that kept the, kept the flow going. Yeah. He would have been in the word of the law, and he was in, he would have, he was in worship, and walking a life uh, as a worshiper of God. So I would say, yeah, that he needed to be faithful to keep that flow there. So do you think these things would have hindered him? Um, they certainly did eventually, but it wasn't it wasn't removed from him entirely because Ecclesiastes reveals to us that he came back to his senses at least to some degree, and he saw some of the error of his way of abandoning the Lord. Um, and uh, fulfilling all of the all of the pleasures that just he felt impulses for, so that that gift from God was still there with him. Let's see if he had stayed. I would say, Elijah, that if he had stayed in right relationship with the Lord, God would have given him wisdom. That same retrospective wisdom earlier to say, "I am." doing too much with my freedoms. Um, I know uh, certainly nothing like Solomon, but I know, I, uh, I haven't talked to him in at least 10 years now, so I didn't know him as a close friend, but uh, I met and spent some, a little bit of time with a leading eye surgeon who I can't say the name uh, because I'm just sharing some of the personal de details that he shared with me when I was in his office. The reason I was there, I was going to Virginia, my brother was getting married uh, on this year, and someone made the connection and told me, and this doctor contacted me, and he knew I was in ministry, and so he wanted to bless me with an extremely discounted LASIK eye surgery. Uh, and the fact that I had glasses on tells you I did not get the LASIK eye surgery. <laughs> And he said to me, no, you're not a candidate for LASIK because of the shape of your eyes. You will need the um, PRK, I think, which is what the Navy SEALs get. And I was like, ooh, I'll take it, you know. And he said, but then he looked at me in the eyes and he said, what are you doing this weekend? And I said, I am reading scripture at my brother's wedding. And he goes, ooh, we can't do it. Because this one, they, the laser goes directly onto the eye, and he said, you will need to be very heavily medicated for at least two days to deal with the pain. And I thought, reading scripture in a wedding under heavy medication, not a good idea, <laughs> and you can't see. And so, oh, <laughs> uh, well, you can see, but, uh, and I was already scared about, I wanted to like, we'll just do one eye, and then a few days later, you know, we'll do the other. So, uh, so that's why I was in his office. And I had never seen an office like this. I was like, man, this guy is successful. And uh, he's leading eye surgeon. Um, and really, and 
he would be in the top echelon in the world of eye surgeons. And he was a part of our church that was uh, in that area when we had lived there. And so he said, and then he started to open up to me while we were talking before he made the determination that he couldn't do the surgery. He said, you know, there was a time in my life when and he had been, he had lived in a different state, and he was of optometry all over his region. He was filling the area with all of these, uh, all of these offices for optometry, and other doctors under him. And he said, there was a time when I was so successful that if in the morning I saw an ad for this new vehicle. He said, there was a time when I would see that vehicle and I would just say a word to my secretary, and just because I wanted it, my secretary would go out and would give me that, would buy that vehicle, just because I felt like it. And he said, I was living that way, and I realized that if I did not stop, it would kill me. So, you know, when people talk to you like that, you really listen to those kinds of stories. He told me some other things. And Elijah, what you're saying there, God gave that man wisdom from above before a downfall came. He did, uh, he did have some uh, consequences and some, uh, I, what, what I would say was uh, some serious burnout and some crashing that occurred in his life as a re result of the way he was living in his, uh, in his great success and uh, riches. But he received wisdom from heaven and he stopped. He sold his practice, sold the whole thing, and he moved to where we were there in Virginia and opened up this new one. And he was still super successful, but he had learned some hard lessons and he was walking in the wisdom of the Lord. And that was amazing to hear that kind of story <coughs> from somebody. Yes? Um, just bringing up a little what Melody said, like, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, because God... God knew that Solomon would fail, would fail. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also David. So I'm just wondering, like, God is always picking people that fail, and He pick like to bring Jesus through that yeah. line. Right. So, oh, I know from Bathsheba and Solomon's life. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't do things the way that we do, and he clearly is a God of mercy. Mercy and grace and forgiveness, and of judgment and wrath. But the long Paul tells us he's a God of mercy. Yeah, and so uh, you're right, though, he picks people who over and over again fall short and sometimes very seriously. And like Paul said, these lives and these accounts serve as examples to us and as warnings because he also picked you and me. And we are subject to the same weaknesses. If we begin to acquire wealth and privilege and status, wealth itself isn't bad. Status isn't bad. There's responsibility and influence, and God gives some people very high status. But if we begin to live out of that in, uh, as a celebrity, you know, and I don't just mean movies people, but celebrities uh, uh, type of behavior and self-assurance in our own circles of influence, we're setting ourselves up for trouble. And history and scripture and the church tells us God lets it happen. So we want to let this serve as a warning. He's a God of mercy and grace. Let's walk on the side of, of uh, being surrendered to the Lord and being cautious and walking in his wisdom so that, we, uh, so that we can be like Elijah said, staying in the right place, doing the right things in the way that we walk with God, that we're keeping that... Uh, flow open, or we're staying in the flow of God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. And not being like religious, because sometimes we're like, we want to be perfect, and, mm -hmm. and we're, like, yeah. we're like religious people, mm -hmm. and that's not what God wants. Yeah. Walking in holiness instead of legalism, 
is a journey that we all struggle with in different ways because we want to walk in holiness before God, and sometimes we end up being legalistic. And then we're like, oh, I'm just too legalistic. And then we get a little too slippery grace, and we're not walking in holiness enough. <laughs> and God's with us, and he, we're in the body of Christ. If we're staying close to other believers, and we have leaders speaking into our lives, and we're humble, and we're teachable, we have teachable spirits, God is going to be faithful to, to do what James says, to keep us from falling. Aren't I so glad that that scripture is there? That He is able to keep you from falling. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we have a better covenant than David and Solomon and the Israelites did. And we have a better, we have lived in a, it is better than the old covenant. And He's able to keep us from falling. So we can do the right stuff, Elijah. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, He's able. Okay. Oh boy. Uh, let's see here. The Lord had previously warned Solomon about the dangers that were in front of him. The warnings included avoiding the worship of foreign gods, which would result in God cutting off <coughs> Israel from the land. So serious, the, the warnings that he gave. And a rejection of the temple of the Lord. And this is what happened eventually. The Lord began to raise up adversaries against Solomon, and the kingdom soon became divided into the two unfaithful, look at this parallel here, the two unfaithful uh, northern and southern kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel became divided. His previous wisdom in threatening to cut the child in half, remember the great display of wisdom? became a sad representation of the kingdom being taken from Solomon and cut in two. And the two kingdoms became like the two unfaithful prostitutes standing before him. The parallels. It's amazing. It is amazing. What happened? So let's talk about Solomon's real treasure. What was his real treasure? And see, we think about, right, how many times have they re remade the movie King Solomon's Mines? When I was looking uh, at some pictures of the temple yesterday, I saw some things of, about King Solomon's Mines, and I kept seeing all these different actors for the main character. I was like, wait a minute, how many times have they remade this movie? <laughs> but we, when we think of treasure, we think of Solomon's great riches and the, the lore and the people that want to find that and stumble or uh, you know dig and find it in a cave somewhere but his real treasure his riches and power made way for great excess in his life contributing to his downfall in the midst of his earthly gain god had given solomon a different treasure that would far outlive his other treasures and pleasures god gave him a gold mine of wisdom and people continue to find life-changing insights and direction through his writings today. From these rich storehouses of God's grace, we have received the majority of the book of Proverbs. Not all of Proverbs comes from Solomon. Most of it does. Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. So very quickly here, five minutes we're going to spend on the book of Proverbs today. How many of you have read all the way through Proverbs so far? Yeah. And the rest of you that have it, great. And by the end of the week, all of you will raise your hand. <laughs> I do one a day every month. That's all I've gotten through. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, when, my, uh, when I was your age, right after Elam, <clears throat> right after graduation, I took a position as an assistant pastor in a small church on the Mississippi River in Iowa with the cornfields. It's actually a big town. It's equal to probably about... Uh, ten limas, but you know it was, felt like a small country town on the Mississippi River there. And um, my mom had given me a set, a tape set. There was no CD players in cars, but well, some cars had CD players back then. <laughs> uh, my mom, I had an old car. <laughs> She'd give me a tape set of Proverbs, and every day I would, on the way to the office that I had at the church or wherever I was going. I would leave the house where I was staying. I would pop those Proverbs tapes in there. And I would just let the words of wisdom just wash over me. And there's something about the book of Proverbs and being a young adult 
that is key to setting your values in the right direction. Your worldly values, worldly wisdom, and being wise about how you order your life with the things that you have to do. Um, the, uh, important things like how you approach the things you pursue and uh, income, the way that you behave with people and go about your daily life. It's very practical. There's something about being a young adult in the book of Proverbs that has touched so many people. And I would just let, I remember listening to those in like, wow, this is so relevant and so applicable. And I would encourage you to do that with the book of Proverbs. Um, Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings made mostly by King Solomon with additional chapters as recordings of sayings from a group of wise men. We've got to cover these things. Uh, as well as Agur and King Lemuel. Some small amounts there from them. One of the most important themes of Proverbs is what? The fear of the Lord. The foundation of a wisely lived life. Which Solomon himself eventually lost as he wallowed in the pit of his selfish desires and sin. The book of Proverbs sets our values straight helps us to avoid foolishness, and instructs us to live in light of eternity. You live by the wisdom of Proverbs. You will not be a fool, and you will not live foolishly. And most of the time, you will not do foolish things. You live by the book of Proverbs. Proverbs represents uh, what we call, I put that in quotes, conventional wisdom. Meaning, most of the time, there are principles for most of life. You live according to those instructions and those wisdoms. Most of the time, things will go well for you. They are not prophecies or promises in the sense that universally, every time, if you obey the Lord and walk in His ways, that nothing bad will ever happen to you. Though they may say you walk in the ways of the Lord and you will be protected from harm. That's why we call this conventional wisdom, because it's a principle for life. Most of your life, you will avoid many bad things. You walk in the wisdom of God. And yet, equally important is the book of Job, which we'll get to later, in wisdom, wisdom from God, which tells us and illustrates for us that bad things happen to good, godly people. So we have the balance there. But most of the time we live by the wisdom of the Proverbs and, and God's wisdom and uh, the Sermon on the Mount and all of Scripture, most of the time we will walk in the blessing and the favor of God and stay away from trouble. Proverbs, uh, here yet, yeah, and there's an example, 132 and Proverbs 132 and 33 would be a standout example of conventional wisdom. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them. Does it always? Uh, when my wife and I last weekend were in Times Square in Manhattan, there we saw people that were not living in the wisdom of the Lord. Lots of them. Does it kill them right away? No. No. But it's, this, is, uh, this is a lifestyle thing. And in the complacency of fools will destroy them. Verse 33. But whoever listens to me, meaning wisdom, will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Does harm ever come to godly people? Yes. Well, the joke. Yeah. But most of the time, we will walk uh, in the blessing and favor and protection of God. All right. Proverbs, and I said this to you, is extremely valuable for young adults when choices and directions about adult life are being set in place. That's what you're doing right now. And if you haven't caught a hold of that yet, that's what you're doing. You are making choices and you're forming a worldview. And you're making decisions about how you're going to live the rest of your life. You're at that place in life, whether you like it or not. Proverbs 2, 6 through 8, we'll finish with this. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. Isn't that how you want to live? He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Let's be his faithful ones. Yeah? Yeah.
Okay, blessings on you today.